Okay, so Taro Isocopola. When you look at the Americans versus mm -hmm. the Europeans, the Europeans are generally slimmer. You talk to people that travel to Europe, maybe from America or another country, and they say, oh my gosh, like I came back and I lost weight and I was on vacation for two weeks or a month or a month and a half. What's going on? Like, what's the difference there? Why are Europeans, at least seemingly, from what we look at, why are they slimmer? Yeah. While I'm at it, one of the things that I do like about Thrive Market, which I talk about all the time on my channel, and I know you're thinking, oh, here comes the plug. Yeah, you're right. Is that Thrive Market doesn't have a bunch of stuff that has weird added ingredients into it. Like they adopt a lot of what sort of the EU puts into place for their processed foods. So like packaged foods at Thrive Market don't have weird additives. There's no red dyes and crazy stuff. So at least even if some of the stuff is processed, like maybe some pantry staples and stuff like that, it's the way that it should be processed because you're processing it, not because you're adulterating it and turning it into some hyper palatable nonsense. So that link that I put down below is for a 30% off discount link for anything from Thrive Market. So when you go ahead and you use Thrive Market, you get 30% off your entire grocery order when you use that link that's down below. They also have frozen meat and seafood options. They're starting to roll out fresh options for some people. You might not see it reflected on your account or not, but the bottom line is they've got really good stuff and they've got canned fish, so they've got like tuna, they've got wild planet sardines and anchovy, I mean, all that stuff if you're into that and you're trying to live more Mediterranean. But some of the things that I love the most are just being able to get healthier snack options for my kids because I don't want to just go to regular Vons or Safeway here in California and get something that has a load of garbage and MSG and stuff in it. If I'm going to get them a snack, I want something that I feel like I don't know. I don't feel bad about giving them. So that's the whole idea behind Thrive Market is being able to bring healthier options to the consumer at a decent price, right? So that link down below gets you 30% off plus a free gift. I really do recommend that you check them out. Check them out. They've been a sponsor on this channel for over half a decade, and I wouldn't be recommending them if it wasn't something that I honestly used myself. So that link is in the top line of the description. Um, there's a lot of reasons. Some are diet related, some are lifestyle related. And I don't think there's like one reason why that happens. And I have to say as a disclaimer, there's it's just like in the States, people in the South might have higher weight um, versus some other states maybe. Similarly to the Europe, not all countries are equally healthy or slim, like the British are not as slim as the Italians, for example. And then there are also processed foods and some of the negative lifestyle creeps are coming there as well but overall i think europeans first and foremost walk a lot more so there's a lot of neat type of action maybe americans are more into like working out versus the daily slow activities of uh of european culture is more common you take public transport you walk that means just like even if you take the public transport you walk from the stop to the other place so there's just more walking and i think portion size so overly simplistically they eat less than they consume right at least compared to the counterparts of americans but yeah portion sizes not always but often at least in the whole day there's a couple smaller meals and maybe one bigger meal during the day what about i mean it's interesting because if you compare levels of wealth or, mm -hmm. or even income not too far off mm -hmm. us versus europe right and you look at the amount of money spent in healthcare and whatnot and like american longevity is not nearly as good as many of the european regions why do you think that is do you think it's a healthcare related thing or do you think it's again it comes back to these lifestyle pieces their diet their activity level their mm -hmm. you know simple simple lifestyle practices we can for sure say that the healthcare system in the us is worse it's just purely by numbers. It doesn't mean it's the only reason why this is the case, but it is surely worse. Because if you look at the healthcare spending per capita, it is, you know, like three, four times higher than many countries that have a better life expectancy. US life expectancy for men and women combined is under 80 years. And most of these countries in Europe and other regions too of the world are over 80 years. And they spend two to $4,000 per person and US spends well over 8,000, closing on nine, I think. So I think there's definitely issues in the, maybe the best healthcare you can get in the world, you can get in the US, but it will cost you a pretty penny 
but the average healthcare is much better in Europe and it's accessible to everyone. Probably similarly, like the top athletes in the world, many of them are American, obviously it's a big country too, but then maybe the average is not as high versus Europe has a pretty high floor, maybe not as high of a ceiling in every case, but much higher floor in healthcare. That makes a lot of sense. And I mean, and we can pull that chart that we've got, we can put it up on the screen, you know, that kind of shows like just to put some numbers to that, because I've mm -hmm. talked about it in other videos, like you look at the amount of spending, you know, on sort of the X axis and the Y axis looking like longevity. And you look at some of these European countries and like Japan, for example, you know, spends a lot less on healthcare, but they have a longer mm -hmm. life expectancy. So it's interesting to look at that because it's not to get into the details of the healthcare system more so as it is a little bit of an equalizer to look at things, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, you can look at this as being like, okay, independent of what we're spending on healthcare, like there's some other things going on. Yes, we spend a lot of money on healthcare, but the fact that our longevity in the United States isn't as good as it is in many other places, we cannot like we, we cannot equate it just because of the amount of money that's being spent, because obviously the United States has a lot of money. There's a lot of wealth here. Doesn't seem to impact our longevity. As a matter of fact, what's that old saying that like sometimes the worst access to health care happens on both extremes of the end, the extreme mm -hmm. like low income and the extreme high income. It's like because you end up in this like um, almost vacuum on either ends. But when it comes down to the food, I want to circle back with that because Looking at, I'm going to reference the blue zones for a second, even though I have some concerns over mm -hmm. the data with the blue zones, as do a lot of people, like there's potential reporting issues, there's all kinds of things. But these are all regions that don't spend ridiculous amounts on healthcare, mm -hmm. but they're doing things that are generally described by how you would describe the lifestyle of the Europeans, mm -hmm. just in different regions. But if we focus mainly on the diet, that's what's most interesting to me, because I can speak for myself, when I go to Europe, I do feel like I can be more relaxed on my diet mm -hmm. and have less digestive issues, feel less lethargic. I feel energetic. I candidly felt like I was able to eat more and came back actually with even better body composition than when I left and mm -hmm. I'm pretty in tune with my body. But do you think that's attributed to the activity level, the lower stress, or do you think the food plays a big part or is that really like a what would they call it, a naturalistic fallacy, and it's like overplayed? Um, I don't know sure if it's overplayed, but it might not be the full pic picture. Mm -hmm. um, my wife is American from California, and we go to Europe every summer, and she eats very clean in the US. And then we go to Italy, France, or Scandinavia, and she lets loose its vacation. And then she like does better. So I've seen it in action many, many times. and. Sure, walking helps, lower stress level helps. Maybe, you know, being in nature helps, all of those things. But I do think the quality of food is a factor. Now, I'm not sure if I fully believe in like, oh, they have better quality wheat as the main reason why people are slimmer, mm -hmm. <laughs> as some people say. It's like, but there are higher quality food items that maybe make you more satiated. And I think that might be the, the big unlock there is, is in the US, the food is sometimes purposely designed to be hyper palatable. So you end up eating more, you keep craving it, right? And in the US, when they use real butter on a croissant or actually make butter from actual buttermilk and they don't pasteurize the honey. So even if you have these high fat, high sweetness items, they like fulfill you more maybe. And instead in the US you eat, but you're still like deficient in some nutrients that makes you crave it more. Let's talk about like guidelines in, mm -hmm. in Europe with food, because I know there's some pretty serious differences, right? Like, I mean, we were talking a little bit before we were recording about, you know, there's sort of this EU standard, but then there's these standards within each given region. And you mentioned yep. like Finland, for example, the honey, like it's pretty much, or it maybe literally is illegal to have uh, pasteurized honey, right? Yep. It's like it has to be raw. And these things kind of trickle into the import and export within different countries within the EU. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you explain how things are different in Europe versus the US just with how food is regulated? Yeah, it is very regulated. It's, it's in many ways, it's way more regulated than in, in the US. And it's mostly to, for two reasons in my experience. One is that Europeans are very proud of food and flavor. So they're very protective of certain 
like from a culinary perspective, certain things. But often it ends up being aligning with the health goals too, because you eat more fresh food, tastier food, more nutrient dense foods. Not always the case, but often they are very culinary focused. The other part is historically the economy was so, each region was very scared that their economy and agriculture would be impacted. So there was a lot of barriers within those systems. So that means that certain things are very hard to do that from a business owner. So like I have a company in Europe and I sell health foods in Europe and I have very few things I can say that the product does from a health claim point of view. I have to be very careful about the standards. We use only organic products, but the organic standards in Europe are higher than in the US. So the, so the requirement just higher than in the US, um, which makes it hard to be an entrepreneur, but in a way it is protecting the consumer from some of the BS that might come with you know, packaged foods and, and the food industry. That's true. And when you look at like the US, I mean, it's kind of turned into just a big like, like mass consumption versus mm -hmm quality of flavor. I'm not even gonna say nutrient quality, I'm just say quality of flavor, because that's yep. one thing. I think maybe some people that are in tune with their body might be able to sort of equate like a nutrient value or nutrient density along with the flavor. You know, when you eat an egg mm -hmm. in Italy, that's like a farm fresh egg compared to a store-bought egg here in the United States. There is a difference in taste that almost makes you feel like I am getting nourished and I don't mm -hmm. feel like I need to overeat later. Whereas, you know, maybe there's something missing here. Another thing that I noticed is, uh, and this might just come down to simply washing the eggs, but I found this very interesting that like eggs were not refrigerated. Like eggs are just on yeah. the shelf. And that Always. Is, yeah, so we, what's, what's the deal with that? <laughs> uh, I don't know the cultural and historical reasons, but yeah, we would not refrigerate the eggs and it will always be in room temperature and they would last a long time. And I've heard this theory that if you then refrigerate it, then you always have to refrigerate it. And I think it's something to do probably with the fatty acid profile, I think. Um, but I don't know actually the history of why that started, but I've also heard about the processing and the washing, but. Yeah, apparently if you wash the shell or something like that once, then you have to refrigerate it like this. Mm -hmm. I have no clue. I'm, I'm totally talking yeah. out of the side of my mouth. But that was just, you know, one example. So when we look at that and you say, okay, this is, I'm getting more nutrition out of this food. I feel more satiated. I mean, that could directly equate to why they're slimmer and whatnot. Yeah. There's also a potential micronutrient play. Like maybe there's just more nutrition in general and the, operate, the body's operating better. But I just, I find it very interesting that just from a standards perspective, like quality remains high across so many different food groups. Whereas in the US, like you have, you know, dairy is very isolated, meat is very isolated. They all have different standards. It seems like in Europe, they're all held to a pretty high standard. And like there's certain things like in the US, it's like dairy we know is held to a, I don't wanna say it's a high standard, it's a high standard in a different way, right? It has mm -hmm. to be pasteurized and almost ruined, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the high standard. But are there areas of Europe, for example, that like raw milk is perfectly legal? Is raw milk legal in Europe, whereas like mm -hmm. it's only legal in eight states in the US? How does that look? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll start with the more philosophical difference and then drill down to specific examples like dairy. Is I think in general, Europeans understand that freshness is good. And in the US, shelf life is prioritized. And I think that impacts both flavor and nutrient density. The other word is seasonal eating. I feel like every European culture is used to eating seasonally, linked to the freshness. And in the US, you get the same buffalo chicken wings year round. So it's like standardized. And I think that mindset difference of expecting convenience and standardization in the US is hurting on the dietary system. To specific examples, Europe, um, it's funny, raw dairy is actually a great example because in raw dairy in a way is frowned upon because it is an easy way to get a foodborne illness, right? So like you can get sick easily if it's not stored properly. So there's a high risk of that. So a lot of like mass milks are pasteurized in Europe too. But then like there's cultural traditions, let's say you buy Gruyere cheese, even in the US, but that is raw cheese because it, it, they wanna protect the history so there are certain things that are actually like protected culturally, which end up helping the consumer because they're like traditional old school things, but the old school means better. Like they make the ice cream with real cream, grass fed, you know, all that stuff. That's so. interesting. So 
are there other examples outside of say dairy and honey where mm -hmm. like, cultural standards will make it or trickle across borders? Yeah, um, the controversial one I think is around wheat and just generally grains and both I think processing grains but also are they sprayed? Uh, this is a common thing that people talk about the prevalence of glyphosate and like it, let's say apples too is like some people or berries strawberries people get very sick of or allergic reactions from strawberries and then they have wild strawberries and they don't get that and then maybe it was something that was sprayed that you got the reaction from and maybe your body's in a constant fight or flight or inflammation because of it and therefore you maybe your body struggles to lose weight not just because of caloric surplus or deficit but also like the constant inflammation could also impact it i think that's like the jury's still out but that is a common belief among people but then if you take something more um more concrete is animals if you take the meat be it fish or wild game or even cows in Switzerland, there is a difference on what kind of cows those are and how they live. And just there's a more of like smaller farms that are maybe not monocrops and there's more of diversity that leads into better quality food overall. So I, I, I think meat, generally the further you go in the food chain, the more quality matters. So like the quality of the salmon and tuna matter more than the quality of herring and sardines same as like the bigger the animal the more you have to be careful about the quality of food versus if you have like dark leafy greens maybe it matters less would you say that like within europe i mean the amount of import coming from outside of europe like are we are, if you look at Italy and you look at wheat and you look at pasta, mm -hmm. is there a fair bit of import coming in from the U.S. into Italy now, mm -hmm. or are they holding a really high standard? No, <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to import foods into Europe. Um, to the point, and I'm 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 not an American. I live here, but I don't have a political stake either way. But that's a big talking point that Donald Trump has had is like Europe doesn't buy our food. And that was like already when he was a president, that was a talking point. And Europe didn't want to buy American food for quality mm -hmm. reasons. Yep. And um, and it, European Union is a big trade partner with the US and there was like issues because of that for trade. But yeah, it's hard to bring food. There are like Moroccan oranges and certain things, foods that are hard to get within the European region, but Europe otherwise is very protective of its agriculture and and Switzerland even more it's kind of isolated it's like you just eat Swiss food there and it's hard to buy Swiss food outside of Switzerland except some of the cheeses interesting yeah because you know it's when I had put a video out talking about the sheer landmass of the United States mm -hmm. and then Europe and how moving things across borders within Europe was pretty easy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it's just EU, it's all kind of seen as domestic. And there was a lot of people, and I, I don't get caught up in the comments, but there is a lot of people that I think they just probably wanted to be loudmouths saying, no, no, it's way more sophisticated, it's way more difficult to move things across. And I don't think they were experts. I think they just live in Europe and maybe think mm -hmm. they know what's going on. But I looked pretty heavily into it and everything that I could find was like import across Europe and export across Europe is all pretty easy. So yeah. you, therefore you could get like, you know, something in in Sicily, growing in Sicily, and you could easily import it up to, you know, North France, right? It wouldn't yes. be that difficult. So the variety of quality food, underscoring mm -hmm. quality, the variety of that and the ability to move it within a, a relatively consolidated land mass, but still diverse enough to have different regions and climates, was pretty easy compared to the United States, where if we had anything like that, you know, we're importing it from Chile or from Argentina, mm -hmm. and it's having to travel so far, and then it's going to sit in a, you know, some logistical sorting facility, and then it's going to go across the country to a mm -hmm. flyover state that can't grow a fresh fruit, and then it's going to sit on a shelf for a week or two. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, like do the math on oxidation, do the math, like how long is this fruit or this food also just like like just the quality is just yep. in general, like we're, we're basically bringing things from all over the place. Whereas like, even if you look at Europe as just like one large community, which isn't accurate to say, but like one large, it, they're all eating for lack of a better term regionally. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's good to clarify is that people use the word Europe very loosely. There's geographic Europe, there's cultural Europe, cultural Europe being like Eurovision song contest or soccer. <laughs> and then there's the European Union and not every country in the cultural geographic Europe is part of European Union. But between European Union, which is most of it and the countries you usually often refer when we talk about Europe, those are our free borders basically of goods and services. So I can go with a European passport and work at any country within the European Union and same way as any good can transport. So it's very easy. Now, do people want to buy it is an, another question. Like Polish food is seen as like lower quality food and then French food is seen as better quality food. But yeah, it, it absolutely can transfer from A to B. Um, and I think that's kind of like not fully understood. And then as far as like, uh, Americans buying food from really far. It also does happen in Europe. I'll take Norwegian salmon as an example. It's famously like fished in Nor uh, just uh, on the coast of Norway and then shipped to China to be sliced and packaged <laughs> and then shipped back to Norway. So there is also a fair share of marketing. Um, marketing, I'll get the Faroe Island salmon or something, but um, there's a marketing also in Europe. But in general, the distances are shorter, the food is fresher, and it is more seasonal, therefore probably higher amounts of various micronutrients and flavor. And I think on the fatty acids, it's the most noticeable because of the oxidization you mentioned. So I think if all the things you prioritize within is is the higher the food, further in the food chain type of foods like meats, and then the fats and the quality of those. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I think that that's probably when I look at the big picture of it, like that was the biggest difference that I would notice is the quality of the fats. And I have a pretty good palate with those kinds of things and you can taste it. Like you can taste crappy oils. You can mm -hmm. taste things that don't taste good, right? And when you look at the kinds of foods that when I was in Europe, I'm consuming more fats than I probably ordinarily do because yep. I'm consuming more eggs, I'm consuming more dairy, I'm consuming more, um, you know, different cuts of meat. And I mean, I also noticed, and this is a side note, we can come back to it, is like the cured meats in Europe are very different than the cured meats in the United States. Mm -hmm. Lots of like, you're looking at two or three ingredients, you know, you're looking at ham and salt versus like this and that, although there are definitely the ones that are not good too, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of gets the whole red meat discussion going. Is it mm -hmm. the processed meat that, or is it the red meat really, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, cause red meat consumption is lower, but they still will kind of group it in with processed meat. I digress. Point is, is that, you know, very, very different foods that seem to have like a different effect, especially when it comes down to the fats and you can taste that and you can feel that because lipid peroxidation and fats oxidizing, it's a very real thing. And that's a very real problem for our cell membranes. And mm -hmm. that's something that can have a short-term effect and have a long-term effect. And it's something that I would argue you could probably feel pretty quickly if you changed in your diet. So as we're kind of talking through this, it's almost like is maybe hypothetically the most noticeable thing that people notice with their, how they feel. Maybe it's less about the gluten thing and maybe it's more about the quality fats that they're getting in that they're not getting in the US. I would be in that camp. I think the gluten is a factor, but I don't think it's the same as like, oh, you can eat, you you know, Italian flour. I've lived in Italy and I can say like, not all Italian food products are of high quality either. It's just good marketing no. too. Um, but yeah, I, I would be more in the point of like, Europe has a really good butter, for example. Yeah. And also cleaner labels. So there's a lot of like social media hype around this now, but like the same product in the US versus UK. And UK is not the cleanest or the healthiest place in Europe, but like the, the labels in the same products like the Heinz ketchup yeah. is like shorter in Europe. And I, I wonder just there is, I'm just theorizing here, but, it just having less foods mixed together is easier for the digestive right. tract or mm -hmm. there's less confusion and like um, less foods at the same time mixed works better than like a lot of things that might be a little bit foreign to the body. I think there's something to be said about that. I think that there's a, a hierarchy in what the body needs, you know, and there's like a, a preferential sort of utilization of nutrients, micronutrients, macronutrients mm -hmm. at a certain point in time that's beyond our control and what's happening sort of at a cellular level. And I feel like the food matrix plays a big role and we start messing with the food matrix, whether it comes down to like hyper processing mm -hmm. or just uh, lots of foods in combination, like simplicity, and, right? And then what we started with was like, at the end of the day, it's like, 
how much calories you consume versus you burn. At yep. the end, it will eventually come down to that. And we know that there's a lot of factors of gut health and hormones and this and that. But at the end, and I feel like in the US, there's also a habit of kind of having the same types of meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and they're all kind of equal sizes. And I feel like in Europe, there are lighter meals. There are the soups. There are the like maybe less calorie lighter gives the digestive tract a break and then a bigger meal in Scandinavia tends to be the breakfast and in the South Mediterranean seems to be more of the big dinner. Um, so I think either can work, but like having um, variety and also meal sizes and types of meals, I think can, can be part of the reason too, that helps you like eat less as the final goal, but also probably also help with digestion. I think that's a huge one. I think because it's interesting. Yeah, it's you got to uh, focus on a bigger breakfast, smaller lunch, and even smaller dinner sort of thing yep. in Scandinavia versus really flip flopped in the Mediterranean. Some would say, okay, well, which one is it? Like if it, if it all comes down to circadian cues, which one is it? And I think you nailed it. Where you know we're starting to see more and more evidence that's suggesting that although the circadian cues and the external cues that we give from food are important, they're maybe not as gigantic as we've thought because you look at these. But what is important is these breaks between meals mm -hmm. and giving the digestive system a break with smaller meals and probably maybe adequate amount of time digestion before bed. Mm -hmm. I think that could play a part. Um, but I think that motility is so important. And if you're constantly eating and constantly grazing, that's one thing that I noticed again, and it could be wrong, but I've noticed that there wasn't like a ton of grazing going on all day. Mm -hmm. uh, there might be a long period of grazing during a long sit down meal. Yes. Like maybe a meal might take two hours, but we know from other evidence that that's actually quite good for metabolism and, and glucose modulation mm -hmm. anyway. So maybe that's beneficial. So although there might be grazing in one particular sit down, there's not a constant consumption throughout the day. Like there wasn't yes. constant needs for snacking. Like at the most, maybe grab like a, a macchiato or something in the mm -hmm. mid afternoon. Like, but that's, that's the extent of a snack. And in social media, you get people give a lot of attention to a specific meal. Let's take the French love to have like three, four courses. You have the starter, you have the main, you got the dessert. And it's like, oh, that's a lot of calories. But if you look at the day when I lived in France I, and I studied there, my fellow students would have a coffee and a croissant in the morning. So how much is that? Let's say 100, maybe 200 calories. Yeah. And then they have a break, uh, lunch, they have a baguette that has meat and cheese and maybe that's five, 600. But like if they have a thousand calorie dinner, which is like a bigger dinner, it's still kind of like the yeah. total daily calorie consumption is lower versus here in the US, you have these like equal size meals or bigger meals and then you have the snacks. So it compounds there is where, where that snack gets you over the hump. And I, I don't think it happens as much in Europe or it's a, Sadly, used to be a cigarette and an espresso, and and now it's probably some other form of coffee. But yeah, yeah, that definitely seems to be the case. And and lastly, like food advertising, like mm -hmm. that. There's different standards in Europe for that too, right? I do know mm -hmm. that there's at least it was a few years ago. Like just the the amount of advertising they could do to children was different. They couldn't yeah. they couldn't like uh, like after certain hours or within certain hours there wasn't certain food advertising. There's not. Uh, Again, I speak from there's relatively old, older literature five, six years ago. So I don't know if it's still the case, but I would assume it probably is. It's like you can't necessarily have like cartoon characters on uh, mm -hmm. these cereal boxes, like trying to attract young children or there's certain regulations on that. Mm -hmm. uh, is that still the case? Have you noticed anything like that? There's a huge difference in marketing, um, not just food, but everything. And it's much more aggressive in the US. To the healthcare point, US and I think New Zealand are the only two countries where you can advertise pharmaceuticals. So from my perspective, the pharmaceutical ads are the ridiculous ones yeah. and where they like slowly play the benefits and how yeah. amazing it is. And then at the end says like, don't take this or you'll have these side effects. Yeah. So yeah, um, advertising is a huge, huge factor for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I think that is, just when it comes down to like, everything that we're talking about, whether you sit in the camp of, I am a firm calories in, calories out, and that's it, or you sit in the camp of, like, even if you're uh, you know, one of these different views on that, right? We still give a thoughtful acknowledgement to the fact that like, overeating is a problem, no matter which way you look yes. at it. And if you're psychologically breeding this philosophy of like food is entertainment and from a young age you're conditioning like food as entertainment and it's and like your passive time is going to be spent eating and you're blasting your d2 receptors constantly with food as a solvent or a way mm -hmm. to solve not a solvent but a way to solve like all your problems 
I mean, that's just setting you up for failure. So well, this enters kind of your expertise in fasting and intermittent fasting initially was like touted a lot with the mTOR and this and that. And then now pretty universally people are aware that maybe 16 hours doesn't do the trick, but maybe the benefit of intermittent fasting was that it made uh, control of ca daily calories easier for some people, not everyone, mm -hmm. um, but it, it made it easier. So I also wonder in Europe the other way, is eating tasty, delicious foods, pizza, pasta, ice cream, this, whatever it is, croissant for breakfast, does it um, psychologically make uh, lower caloric amounts easier because you had your treats the opposite of that is that if they're hyper palatable you want to eat a second and a third and a fourth but if you allow yourself these pleasures does it make actually eating less calories in a day easier psychologically mm -hmm. and how much of that is actually physiological and how much it's just easier to yeah. eat less calories it's funny that you mentioned that because i decided to track a couple of days the best that i could when i was like relaxed on my diet and it came out to one day 2,300 calories, another day 2,600 calories, and I felt like I was eating everything I wanted to. I wasn't going to town, but it was just that. It was being responsible. Having a croissant, having a latte, having a normal lunch. I had like, just like you said, it was like a baguette, baguette with salami. And what I appreciate there is different. Instead of using mayonnaise, it's butter. Like, <laughs> yes. It's awesome, like a salami sandwich. So having that, and then having pizza for dinner along with some like insalata de mare. Like, mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, basically that, I got to 2,500 calories, and I felt, if you had to ask me how many calories I consumed, like psychologically, just knowing what I know about some of these foods in America, I probably would have told you I consumed like 3,000, just mm -hmm. because it feels like bad food to me, mm -hmm. right? But being able to have those foods and actually feeling satiated by it, I didn't feel the need to graze all day. Granted, maybe it's not the best for my specific like 5% mm -hmm. body fat fitness goals, but I can see like if just staying slim is the goal and longevity and just being able to stay in a minimal caloric deficit of five, ten percent week over week for the most part, along with high activity, that would probably work. And when mm -hmm. you factor in how much I was walking, I would say that net net my total deficit was probably significantly more. Yeah. Probably the American culture is better if you have fitness calls and, and prioritizing protein even more. That's probably is is better than Europeans then to prioritize fats and carbs more, maybe. But at the same and at the end of the day, probably for longevity, uh, being a caloric deficit has so many benefits we don't even understand for from a lifespan point of view and then the activity on top of that, right? No, I totally agree, man. Well, Tara, where can everyone find you, brother? Instagram, I am Taro, T E R O, and YouTube, um, I am Taro as well. Perfect. Thanks, Boom. Thanks. Cool.